Hello, 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 hello. So give me a shout out if you can see and hear me. I hope everyone is doing well. So welcome back to another Z Classroom Live developer stream. So during this uh, pandemic, we've been doing these uh, daily streams from the developers here at Pixelogic. And so today, which is Wednesday, is usually the day I go, and then I also come back on Friday. Um, for the streams that I've been doing for this, I try to go through and uh, kind of handle it in more of a basic type fashion. So not really diving into anything like really advanced, um, but going through processes that uh, step by step so you can follow along and kind of focusing on if you've just downloaded the trial and using the trial and getting to something at the end that you're kind of excited about, maybe happy about um, <clears throat> going through that entire process. So to start off, the trial for ZBrush 2020 is available. So if you have anyone that you know that is looking to try out ZBrush, maybe test it out and give it a go, um, you can definitely uh, download the trial. It is free. It does not have any restriction with it other than it will expire after 30 days. So you have 30 days to mess with basically the full version of ZBrush. Uh, so if you want to learn it, it's a great way to just try it out and see how it works. Along with these development streams, you can log into these and then um, you know, follow along. Uh, Paul's been doing a lot more of advanced stuff, and then Solomon and Daisuke have been following up on some ZBrush Core item as well. So we have uh, ZBrush Core and the professional version, and you can kind of go between the two. In addition to the trial version, there's also the ZBrush to Keyshot Bridge, which you can uh, download a trial of that as well. Uh, the stuff I'll be covering on Friday, I'm going to be using the ZBrush to Keyshot Bridge. So if you have the trial and you want to follow along with the stream I'll be doing on Friday, I will be going to Keyshot for a little bit. So definitely um, probably want to grab that and uh, go from there. So today we are focusing on uh, illustrations and um, using some of the techniques that we pulled from, from the last class where we went into spotlight and model the spotlights. So we're gonna use some of that. Uh, we're also gonna hit some deformers to deform our pieces after we create them. And then we're gonna be doing it all in MPR or non photorealistic uh, photograph <laughs> photorealistic rendering. So NPR, non-photorealistic rendering. And so we're going to do the whole process today in that kind of format. So to start off, I have uh, ZBrush launched here. And this is a live stream as well. So if you have any questions, um, if they're not too advanced, I can probably cover them. If there's something I'm working on at the time, you have a question about it, you can definitely um, you know, send it out there in the chat and I'll try to answer it. So today we're focusing on NPR. So if you just launched ZBrush, this is your first time, this is what you're gonna be greeted with. So at the top here we have Lightbox. And this can be toggled on and off by clicking this little button here. And Lightbox, Lightbox is basically, think of it as a bridge that Photoshop has. So this allows you to see all sorts of ZBrush files in this you know, explorer type format. So in here you can see in the project tab at the top here, we have a whole bunch of projects and these are really good to start from. So most of the time, if you've launched ZBrush and you wanna start sculpting something, uh, I usually end up grabbing one of these default Dynamesh spheres here. And to load any of these projects in, you just come across them and double click and then they'll be loaded right in your scene and you can just start sculpting. So today we're gonna to go into the NPR folder. So in Lightbox here, we're at the project area and then there should be a folder called NPR, and we're just gonna open this up. And in this NPR folder, we have a bunch of presets, and these are set up all ready to start the process. So we can go in and grab one of these, load it in, and then the materials are gonna be set up to look kind of like a line drawing inside of ZBrush. So you can then sculpt on this and do some different effects. So the one we're gonna look at today, or gonna to use, is this Cartoon Render 02. So this is the one you wanna hover over and then load in. So to load a file through Lightbox, you just need to select it and then double click and that will load right in. If you have any projects before that you've been working on, you may get this little dialog that's gonna pop up and ask if you wanna save changes. Uh, so if you have not saved, it's a good time now to hit that quick save or hit cancel to this and then hit that quick save button up there. If you've just launched ZBrush, you can just click no and that will now load in that project. So with this project loaded in, this is what we are going to see. So navigation inside of ZBrush, uh, using the alt-click navigation, uh, you can move around your model, rotate it, let me draw a line here, by clicking and dragging on the canvas, and now rotate your mesh. Then if you hold down the alt key and click and drag on the canvas, that'll allow you to pan your mesh. And then while you're holding and rotating to 
with just click and drag, you can hold down shift and this will lock it into front, back, and side views as well. Now for the zooming inside of ZBrush, it's giving you this functionality. This can be a little tricky with the alt-click navigation. Uh, you can also use these little icons over here. So we have move, zoom, and rotate, and these will perform those functions as well. So if you're a new user to ZBrush, you can use these to manipulate the camera around your model as well. While you're doing this, if you accidentally hit any of these options up at the top here, these are going to give you like a digital zoom uh, for your canvas. So oftentimes, if you're a new user and you're looking to zoom, scale, or rotate your model, you may come up here and use these. And these are going to affect the canvas. So basically think of it as, you know, the document inside of Photoshop. And this is giving you that zoom into the pixels of the canvas. So if I zoom this in, you're going to see my model is going to start getting pixelated. And this is because I'm zooming in to the... Uh, the surface of the screen there rather than zooming into the model. If you do this by accident, you can just click this actual button and that'll return it back to where it is. Uh, another thing that I want to hit on that you may run into if you're using uh, ZBrush as well, and this is another common one that new users will often hit, is if you're used to using other applications, you probably end up saving sometimes by hitting uh, Shift S and that will usually runs a save in other applications. Uh, in ZBrush, what this is going to do, it's going to generate a snapshot. So if you hit Shift S, you're now going to end up with two of your meshes on screen. And you'll notice that the one you can still rotate around, and this other one is just kind of hanging out in space. So what is happening here is ZBrush is taking your 3D model, and it's snapping it to the canvas, and it's putting in this 2.5D mode. So the original versions of ZBrush, before all the 3D stuff was implemented, was ZBrush was designed as a 2D painting program that then it contained depth. So you could paint with RGB and then you could add depth to it to get nice surface details, say like paint strokes and things like that. So that is uh, what ZBrush was originally designed around. And so this snapshot functionality here um, is kind of left over from that and you can hit Shift S and that will uh, generate that effect. And if it happens, you know, if you keep doing it, I can get multiple of these spheres all over. And you can actually use this to your advantage to generate textures and some other alignment things for rendering front, back, and side views of your model. But in this state we're at now, we just want to sculpt on our mesh, and so you don't really want to do this. So to clear this out, you can just press Control plus N on your keyboard, and that will clear the canvas, and now you're going to be left with just that 3D version of the model. So one little thing there, too, that you may run into if you're a new user of ZBrush. So with this model loaded in, you can see it's already looking kind of like a line drawing, right? So I've got gradient values coming across the surface. It's just a sphere. I can turn off my uh, floor grid here. And you can see it's looking plausibly believable as something that's drawn. Now with this, at this stage, you can do anything you can inside of ZBrush to this, and it's going to retain this look. So if I come in and say grab the standard brush and increase my draw size and start sculpting on this, you're seeing be able to affect the model, and this effect is going to go with it. So you can really have a lot of fun, you know, just going in and sculpting on a mesh really quick and changing the result, and you're going to see it in this view. So using things like the move brush gives some different results and things like that, but this way you can actually go through and sculpt on your mesh as if it was, you know, in 2D. And so me personally, I can model <laughs> anything in 3D, but if you give me a sheet of paper um, and tell me to draw something, I can sketch something out to like get my idea across. But as terms, in terms of getting a uh, elaborate, immaculate illustration for you, it's not gonna happen if you just give me a pen and a piece of paper. Um, I can paint too, but I can, drawing has just never been a, uh, a thing that's processed well uh, in my brain. But with this, what I can do is I can sculpt anything I want, and then after I sculpt this effect, I then now have this kind of base point for a 2D illustration, and then I can go in and finish it off that way if I want to. So today we're going to focus on this, and we're going to model some stuff and keep it in this kind of 2D format as we work on this. And we're going to use some various elements uh, to our designs here to generate a quick little robot. So if you want to do the sculpting process, you can definitely do the sculpting process with this mode as well. And to get back to where we were, I'll just reset the scene here quick, is we're going to go to Lightbox, in Lightbox, we're going to make sure we're in the Project tab. We're going to go to the MPR folder. And then in here, for this one, we're using the uh, Cartoon Render 02. And so that's how you can load this starter file up again and then start sculpting. So now, in addition to just the preview we see here, um, you can render this. And you can render this with BPR, which is ZBrush's best preview render.
Uh, to do this functionality, you just need to come over here and click this button that's labeled BPR. And this will now process your scene, because right now we're in like 2D kind of preview mode. And it'll process it in a render and beautify it up, add some anti-aliasing, smooth out some lines, it'll allow you to get shadows cast on your model. So this is kind of just the rendering system inside of ZBrush. Now if I click this, you're going to see this effect take place on my model. So now it's even looking more hand-drawn, right? So before I had a preview, I had that grid showing up. Now this has completely removed that, and now we have the sphere here. I have these lines that are kind of giving this undulation effect to it. They're kind of scriggly or scraggly, and then I have a shadow around this sphere as well. So all I did to this was just click this BPR option here, and that is now generated render. Now what we're seeing here with that BPR process is it's using a set of filters inside of ZBrush that happens after the model has been rendered. So it renders the model and then it applies a set of these NPR filters on top of it. And these NPR filters can change the entire way your model looks inside of ZBrush. So if I take this sphere here and click BPR, you know, this is the result I'm getting here. Now let's say I want to try some of these different filters to get a different look on my mesh. So we can go back into Lightbox by clicking this button here or hitting comma on our keyboard. And then if we navigate to the top here, there's a filters area and a render set area. And if you allow these to load, you'll see all the different kind of rendering effects you can apply to your scene. And these will be able to be applied to any model that's inside of ZBrush. And they're going to give you a whole wide range of different results. So as an example, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come up here to Lightbox and there's these three, four little uh, tabs here. And this is going to allow you to display how many rows are going to be visible in Lightbox. So I want to condense this down to one row only so I can see the model on the canvas as I manipulate these areas. So I'm going to click this one here and now I'm just going to get a single row in Lightbox. And so those are just these little objects here and you can go through and click these and change how many uh, rows are appearing in Lightbox. So now that I have it down to one row, I can clearly see my mesh on screen and I can also scroll through these render sets at the top here. Now what I want to do with the option I have here is I want to use the filters first. Now filters inside of Lightbox here are only going to apply the filter. The render set ones are going to apply render settings and filters. So for this little demonstration here for the model that we just load in, I'm not, wanting, I'm not going to apply the render set first because that's going to take a little bit longer to load through each one of these, but the filters are going to just instantly apply. So we can just double click and see the change instantly. So make sure we've rendered with BPR and then now I'm just going to go through some of these and you can see the drastic change that's going to happen on screen. So this was the default one I had and now if I click say this abstract ZPR one, it's going to kick in and now I get this effect. So that might not be what you're looking for, so we can go to the next one. And you can see as I scroll through these and just simply double click, you can see how drastically my sphere is changing. So this is going to allow you to get a whole wide range or new looks for your models. So you can model something once and then you can come through and start applying these different effects. So this one is a charcoal one, which looks really cool on the sphere, right? So this is just, I loaded that project in, I went to the charcoal one, double clicked it in the filter area in Lightbox, and this is the result I'm getting. And so you can see this is all the process I'm doing. I'm just coming through and double clicking and I'm getting a brand new result. And so there is a ton of these in here and we'll use some of these um, more again later, but you see the drastic change on all this. So I'm gonna click this uh, charcoal one here for now. And with these, you're not limited to, you know, applying it once only in the scene. Since the model's in 3D, if we rotate around the mesh and re-render, that version of this object will be updated. So let's get out of Lightbox by hitting comma or closing this. And now let's rotate our model around and then let's draw something on this again just so we have a little different shape here. And we'll do, we're not going to do anything crazy, just adding some different variation to this. And now let's render with that BPR again. So you're going to see this is going to update now and I'm going to get that version of the model with that same filter. And I can rotate this if I want to see this from this way and render. So it's giving me the exact same thing. I can look top down and render. So the one thing nice about this NPR filter effect inside of ZBrush is that you can move and change your shape and then you don't have to repaint the entire thing, right? The filters are going to kick in and wherever your model is looking, you're going to get that result. So now just rotating my model down, I've got some little creature here. I could even come in and say, give him some little eyeballs here 
And then if I re-render, now I have this. So very quickly, you can just manipulate your shapes, apply a new filter, and get a new result. <clears throat> so we have one question. Is there a way to create custom filters and lightbox settings? By all means, yes, there is. Um, so I'm not going to go into depth too much of that because there is a whole bunch of them, and it, it's very daunting, especially if you've just launched ZBrush for the first time. Uh, but they live in the render palette, and in the render palette, there is a BPR filters area. And in here are all the controls for the filters. So you have a set number of presets you can apply to your filters or to, your, uh, to the filtering system. So you have 12, you can basically apply 12 filters. And then with those, you have the ability to change what, to different filters. So there's a whole bunch of these. And if you click on this filter option here and open this up, you can see these are the list of the filters that are in there. So we have noises, we have blurs, we have sharpens, we have glows, we have displacement, which is giving that nice squiggly line. Uh, we have a bunch of cost, uh, contrast ones, we have reflection ones. The ones for creating cross hatching would be using the texture overlay. That'd be the ones for those. Um, you also have some screen tones, flat shading. So there's just a whole list of these. Now, if you find a filter you like, you can always go in and look at see how it was made too. So if I go back to Lightbox here and I go to that filters directory, let's find something that's got a little hatching to it. Let's see what this one looks like. Or maybe this one. So with this, we can see that now if I go in here, the circles that are open are the ones that are applied. So these are the ones that are applied to give me the result I'm seeing now. And through here, I can start turning these off and you'll see the filter is gonna be updated in real time. So as I come through here, you can kind of hover over these and see what filters applied. So there's a displace there, um, fades, colorize, contrast, sharpen, saturation, material shading, which is one that was giving different material coloring to it, sharpens, and an orton. See my phone has got the color cross hatching here. I think this one may have it. The one we were on originally. Now let's go to filter thin and let's see what's on these. So we got displays, saturation. Here's the texture overlay. So this filter here would be a good one if you just want to see how the cross hatching is happening. So it has a texture overlay that's being applied. And this is just a texture map that's loaded inside a ZBrush and then linked. And then this is now taking it and throughout the various processes that are listed here, it's applying it to certain areas of the model. So if you take Open up Lightbox and then go to Filters and locate the Charcoal uh, Lightbox option right there. And then if you now go to Render and go to the BPR filter area, uh, the filter number three in that stack there has a texture overlay and that'll go through and you can kind of see how it's making that cross hatch. Um, we'll cover it a little bit uh, towards the end here, but I need to get modeling here <laughs> so we actually make something uh, to get into these filters. And you can toggle these on and off and see how they're applying. So. I'm just doing that kind of process. Let me move him out of the way here. You can see the change here on these. So if I enable them, you can see how these are affecting the render as well. So that's the crosshatch one right there. So you can see how it's coming across the model. And where that mesh is darker, it's applying you know, a little more of that crosshatching versus the other one. And that's all related to the settings that are divided here. So if I up or down, change this opacity. You can see how it's affecting it. So there's a lot of options you can do with these filters, um, and there's a lot of variables you can play with, and they're gonna change that filter entirely. So there's a lot of functionality through there. But for just the base general process, if you just wanna launch ZBrush, sculpt something and apply a filter, you can just go through Lightbox, go to the Filters tab, and then come through and start clicking on these, and they're gonna give you, you know, different results on your mesh. So now I have some this little ghost character that's happy accident ghost that's doing some weird stuff. All right, let me see uh, these questions here. Uh, Saeed's asking where to active, activate multi-filters together. So the filters with those amounts you have, there are some ones where you can, uh, there's a filter where you can actually capture a filter set and then it'll save that and then you can modify the whole thing. Um, so there is a way uh, to do that. Um, so you can you know, set up a filter and then capture basically what is happening and then store that as one filter and then reset all the other ones. Uh, so you can do that process. You can also remember inside of ZBrush, you can always render out multiple passes. So you can do one filter pass one and then one filter pass two just by changing. So right, if I come up and have this one, I can then go to, to save out the effect. You can go to document 
an export, and that's going to give me this. And then if I want to combine it with another filter uh, kind of effect, I can go and load another one, and then now go to document and export that one out. And then you can blend those. You can always composite the stuff together in Photoshop to get a blur or a mixture of certain filters. All right, so that is the brief functionality of the filters. And now we're going to reset my project one more time, and we're going to start modeling something. So we're going to go back to Lightbox here. I'm going to get back to a grid of three. So we just came over and clicked that. And then we go back to that NPR area and I'm going to load in that Cartoon Render 02 again. And now we can start modeling some stuff. All right, so for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this little sphere here. I'm going to get out of perspective. And now I'm going to use the uh, spotlight stuff we were doing the last uh, live stream I did to model a basically a robot. So just taking shapes or alphas and generating geometry out of them, repositioning that geometry, getting a silhouette I like, detailing it some, and then we're going to go in, uh, divide that mesh up to give it enough geometry to paint on, and then we're going to use the filters to finish it off. So I'm going to go to the texture palette first, and up here I'm going to click the light box to spotlight buttons, and this is going to open it up. Yes, NPR stands for non-photorealistic rendering. So instead of having it look photorealistic, we can have it look like it's cartoon shaded, cell shaded, hand drawn, uh, abstract painted. So there's a bunch of different filters inside of ZBrush that will kick in and allow you to generate those different results from your 3D model. So in the spotlight area here that opens up in Lightbox, I'm going to locate this hard surface spotlight right here and double click that. This is now going to load this into Spotlight. And if I hit Z on my keyboard, I'm going to get the wheel. And then I can click off and move all these around. Now, these may be a little bit hard to see, especially if you have a white background. So it is usually, uh, when you're rendering with NPR, you usually want a really light background to give the feeling of paper. And then you have your model kind of on that. And that will give you like more play with the background coloring and toning. But it doesn't work all that well for uh, you know using the spotlight option here because the black is cold out, and I'm basically seeing white on top of white. So I'm going to quickly come up to the document area here, and I'm just going to change my document background color to a darker color. So to do this, just go to document, and then there's this little uh, back color option here. And if you click and drag, and then move this anywhere inside of ZBrush, the background will pick up that color. So if I want orange as my background, which is you know crazy, um, you can just drag this, and it'll pick it. You can go to the color wheel here and pick a different color. And any kind of color slider inside of ZBrush, you'll be able to use this. So if you just do this click and drag, it'll allow you to um, pick a color that's on screen. So now with this, I've got my light box parts over here. So these are a bunch of 2D alphas that are basically white and black value things. And I just want to grab one of these and I want to generate a shape out of it. So to do this, I'm going to come over here and click and it'll get highlighted. Then I can center the spotlight wheel to the center of that alpha. I can scale this up and down. And then I can also snap it to the middle of the model I have selected. So if I come across the sphere here and snap, you see it's going to snap to the center of that sphere. And now that I have this you know, in that same space as that sphere, I can now turn this alpha into geometry. And to do this, you just want to position the size of this alpha. And then you want to come down here and click the Snapshot 3D button. This is going to take the alpha you have selected, and it's going to convert everything that's white to a mesh, and then it's going to extrude it in the Z based on the subtool you have selected. So if I scale this to say here and click the Snapshot 3D button, and then I'm going to hit Shift Z to get out of Lightbox. If I rotate around, you'll see this is what I have on screen now. So if I go to my subtool palette, I got my initial sphere, and then now I have this mesh that was created from that snapshot process. So I'm going to hide the sphere by coming over here and clicking this eyeball icon, and now I'm just left with this part. And then in here, I can adjust my subtool count a little bit because I'm going to add some more of these. And now I can manipulate the shape if I want. So I have kind of a design I kind of want to do with this. So I want to generate, you know, a little robot here. So this is what my process usually involves. So I'll start with a shape, kind of move it around, see the different angles of it. Um, and then maybe I want to manipulate it, so I'll often use the you know, Gizmo 3D to just change or scale the different aspects. So maybe something like that. Maybe I want to come up a little bit wider. Maybe push that back some. And I'm just looking at the form, basically. So I generated a shape out of the alpha, and now I'm playing with the design.
So now I want to add a little more shapes to this. So I'm going to reposition the model and wherever your model is repositioned when you use this uh, snapshot functionality, it's going to generate that shape based on that camera plane. So if I rotate to the side here by just clicking and dragging and holding shift, now I can bring back up spotlight by hitting Z on my keyboard. I can now pick say a different shape like this one here, snap my spotlight wheel to the middle of that, scale this up. I can now use the Christmas in the corner option to adjust that alpha. So I can do this to scale it out, maybe make it a little bit bigger, maybe rotate it some, and I can kind of play with how this is gonna interact with my main form. So I may wanna do something like this. So I kind of have this torso area and then some sort of like shoulder chest area, and then we'll have another part that'll come down here maybe. So after I'm happy with where this is, click the snapshot 3D button, it's gonna turn it in geometry. So you see you get a new subtool there. I can now take this and move that off again and let's generate another shape. So I'm gonna extend it with the Christmas in the corner down here and rotate this, position it like that, maybe scale down a little bit and then generate that one as well. And now I'm gonna hit Shift Z to get out of Spotlight there. So this is what I've got at the moment. So I've got that main shape, which is its own subtool. Then I've added this top one and I've added this bottom one. So you can see all these are at the same kind of depth, right? So they're all falling in the same thing because when I generated them, whatever subtool I've selected, after I use that snapshot 3D inside of a spotlight there, it's gonna take that shape and it's gonna base the depth on whatever subtool I've selected. So since the subtool I selected was this one and all three of these had that same depth or and I generated, they're all gonna have that same depth. So I now wanna kinda of distort this because if I look at this way, I'm getting a decent silhouette up here, but if I look this way, I'm getting this weird kind of shape. So I'm gonna come and grab the top one here and I'm gonna to go to move, scale, or rotate and drag this out. Just make that a little bit wider. So a little more interesting silhouette. Now I've got a T. And then I'm gonna come here and click that and then maybe scale this one in. So now I have that happening. And then I'm gonna go back to my original tool and maybe make that a little bit wider. So as you're doing this, you can play with the designs quite a bit. You're not locked into one thing. You can always go back and change them. You can delete these things, um, whatever you want. But basically as I'm rotating around the mesh here, I'm kind of looking at the silhouette, uh, just made out of basic shapes basically, and just trying to see something that I like or something that catches my eye. Uh, let's get these questions here. Uh, Saeed's asking, is there a way to put a multi-light with different color and activate them all? Um, you can definitely add, you know, as many lights to your scene. So in the light palette, there's a bunch of lights up here and you can colorize these as well with this option here. So that'll add you, allow you to add color and then you can turn them on and you'll definitely cast color on your mesh. Um, you can also, in the filters, you can isolate by a different colored thing and then that will now take the property of that filter into that colored area. So there are some ways like that. Um, most of you're asking on Facebook, you are not focused. I'm not sure quite what that replies to. Um, if you can clarify that, I may be able to help you there. And Mustache is asking about the photorealistic stuff. So the NPR was one that was kind of not, we have a bridge with Keyshot, which allows us to get a lot of the um, photorealistic stuff. And then the NPR stuff was what we were kind of more focused on because uh, ZBrush is more of a creative type process and we wanted some way to translate some of the models into something different. Uh, so that's the very uh, process of the NPR. But you can definitely get uh, photorealistic renders out of BPR. There's just a lot of settings. Uh, you can definitely go into the light areas in here. You can load in uh, HDR texturing, um, or not HDR maps for uh, lighting information, things like that. Uh, Paul's stream, he's been doing ones on material. So his last two streams, I believe, have all been on the material properties and setting up your scenes with that lighting information. So you can add gobos to the lights and things like that. Um, so I definitely recommend if you want to see how to get some of that photorealistic stuff inside of ZBrush, uh, check out Paul's streams and he goes through a lot of that. So today we're just focusing primarily on uh, the, um, the NPR stuff. All right, so now I've got this base object here. The next thing I wanna do with this is I wanna take these and I wanna soften their edges a little bit. So each of these shapes, when they're generated with spotlight, if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see it's giving me 
this face here, and then it's taking this face and extruding it to another face. So this edge is pretty harsh, right? So every time I generate something out of Spotlight, it's giving me this harsh edge. Now this does create a nice light catching line, but I wanna soften that up a little bit, maybe give it a little bevel. And to do this process, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use a hidden thing that's in the curve menu. So if I go to the tool palette and then go down to geometry, or rather the crease menu, and then I go to crease, in here there's this bevel width slider right here. And if you have a subtool selected, like the one here, and the spotlight geometry is perfect for this, and you hold down the control key, and actually I don't have my keyboard. Let's get my keyboard over here. There we go. So now you guys can see what I'm doing with the keyboard. So now I come down here and I hold the control key and then click and drag with this. You see it's going to apply this edge bevel. And this is looking at the polygrouping on the mesh here and it's adding a beveled edge to wherever those polygroup meets. So you can see I have this, and then I've got now this spacing. So this is what I had originally, and then just by holding control and changing this bevel width slider, I've now got this result. So I've just softened that edge up. Now with the BPR uh, material on here, this is gonna be a little bit harder to see. Um, I did cover it in the last uh, Z Classroom Live as well, when we were going in the spotlight stuff but you can see now I have a bevel there. So I'm gonna do that process to all of these parts. So I'm gonna to go to the next one, this top one here, and do the same thing. So once again, if I turn this on, you can see this is the polygroup breakup, which was created from the Spotlight Snapshot 3D. Now I'm gonna hold Control and click and drag in the bevel width area, and just apply a slight bevel to that shape. And then I'm now going to select the next part, which is this one. See so the polygroup distribution on that. Hold down control, click and drag and bevel width, and now I have a bevel there. So now I've gone through and softened up the edges of that shape a little bit. So now that I have this as like a torso, and I wanna make some sort of legs uh, for the character here. And do that, I'm gonna use snapshot again. So I'm gonna come down here, and I'm going to just re-aim my model like top down. And for the legs, I kinda want, you know, Maybe some sort of triangle shape uh, that comes down and kind of spiky and then maybe you know a leg that has some swooping elements to it so I get this kind of weird silhouette type shape and then have this little like pinpoint legs like if they're running around on like very like tipped shoes or tipped toes for my mech so it's he's not going to do very well in slippery surfaces but uh, if he goes out in like a muddy field he's going to be able to spike in right so so let's generate some kind of legs like that so I'm going to position my model like this Hit Z to go back into Spotlight here. And I'm just gonna rotate these guys out of here because I don't need that shape. And in here, I'm gonna find another shape. So let's grab, hmm, let's grab this one. And so I'm gonna take this circle here. I'm gonna snap the wheel to the middle of the alpha. And then I'm going to snap that there, scale this up. And then I'm gonna just kind of move it off in space. And I wanna move it in the middle of the world right now. So as I'm using this, I can snap to the selected subtool I have. This will allow me to snap to the middle and different edges of that mesh. And if I snap to one of these and then I wanna move it so it's aligned in the plane, I can click and drag. And as I'm performing this move, if I hold down shift, it's gonna keep that aligned to where I'm dragging. So this will allow me to move this out of my main form here, but it's gonna keep it aligned like that. And now with this, I can come through and I can extend this left or right. So if I drag this out, I'm just going to be able to change the shape a little bit. Maybe want to scale it down some. So something like that. So this is going to give me kind of that top-down view of this little kind of spiky leg I want. After I'm happy with that, I'm going to click the Spotlight Snapshot 3D button there, and then hit Shift-Z to go back, and now I have that part generated. Now, once again, the depth of that part was gonna be based on the subtool that I had selected. So I had this one selected. So that is why the depth is that length. Now with this shape, I wanna taper out the bottom and I wanted to form it a little bit. And for this process, the way I wanna do this is I wanna take the shape and I wanna use a deformer for it. So I don't really want it straight. Maybe I want something where I come through and say, have this shape and then generate you know, this kind of taper right and then maybe make this a little bit longer like that but then i also want to have a bend right so i want a little bit of a bend design to it so i don't just want it to be this kind of straight asset i want it to spike down to the bottom but then have a little curve so right now the shape that's created um, from spotlight 
as we talked about earlier, has geometry on the top, and then has geometry on the bottom, and then it just has geometry that's connecting it. And the connection options through here has no subdivisions in it. So this is a very flat form. So it's basically, there's just long edges that are going from this shape to this shape, and that's making the result. So there's no cross sections on this part. And so what this means, if I apply a bend and try to get this to bend like that, it's gonna flat, right? So I don't have any geometry to support the bend. So I need to add some geometry to this mesh to support that bend. And to do this, what I can do is just remesh this model or give it brand new topology, and I can just use Z Remesher for that. So I'm gonna come up here to the tool palettes, I'm gonna go to the geometry area, and then I'm gonna come down to Z Remesher. And in here, I'm going to activate keep groups, which is gonna keep this top poly group and the bottom one, and then the one in the middle. And then I'm now gonna click Z Remesher. Now Z Remesher is gonna go through and it's gonna look at your model. And it's gonna look at you know, whatever settings you have in here. So I have groups. So it's gonna to try to keep those groups. And then it's gonna go through the entire mesh and try to give you quadded topology across everything. So basically it's trying to automate the process of taking a model and turning it into a low resolution version. And the process here is very quick. Sometimes it gives you perfect results. Uh, sometimes you may have to go in and clean up a little bit, but for a one click solution, it's extremely powerful. So it doesn't hurt if you wanna try getting new topology on a model to just come over here, click zero mesher, see what it gives you um, before you even go in and start trying to do any manual retopology. So I'm gonna click zero mesher and this is gonna process. And you can see this is the result I'm getting out of that. And if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see this is what I had. So you can see these long lines and then a bunch of tessellation and a bunch of tessellation. And then after using the Z Remesher, I now have the top tessellated. I have a lot of divisions through here, but you can see they're quadded out and then some divisions on the bottom. So I've just modified that shape and now I have something I can bend, okay? So now I'm gonna turn off these polyframes and rotate my part like this. And now I wanna use a deformer. And so the deformer process uh, basically is gonna allow you, some of the deformers are gonna basically allow you to get like this lattice type effect where you can go in and manipulate a high resolution model with a lattice. So thinking of like, you have this mesh, it's got a bunch of points, but it would be difficult to modify all those points individually. However, we can apply say a lattice deformer on top of this. This is gonna give us a grid with a lot less points and then we can manipulate the shape like that. So to activate a deformer, you first need to have your subtool selected. And then I'm gonna come up here and select Move, Scale, or Rotate. And this is gonna give me the Gizmo 3D. You can center the Gizmo 3D by clicking this Go to Unmasked Mesh Center, and that'll go to the middle of your selected subtool. And then now we wanna locate this Customize option here, and that's this little gear icon. And when we click this, this is now gonna open up this window here. And in here, we have a bunch of deformers. So at the top, we have some primitives. So we can change the shape that we currently have selected to a different primitive type. So this is another way to make you know, base shapes inside of ZBrush. And then below this is where all the deformers. So bend arc would work good on this one, bend curve. Um, but what I want is the deformer. And so we have this option right here. Now, when I click this, this is now going to activate the deformer on the model. And you can see this is the result I'm getting. So I have this cage that's now flowing around my model and it has all these little points. So I can move these points and it's gonna manipulate the mesh based on those rather than on its individual topology. Now there are some cones here and deformers, if you never used them before, they have these cone system, which will allow you to change different options. And if you hover over these, you'll see there's gonna be some text right here that appears. And this will show you what those processes are gonna do. So if I rotate off, let's see if I can find a piece of canvas here. That, there you go. So you can kind of see the different options as I hover over this. Now the one options here are these divides for this deformer, and this will allow you to increase the amount of tessellation along that cage, right? So if I click and drag this, you can see I'm gonna get more of that cage control across the model. And you can set these to various numbers to allow you to get you know, more precise control when you're using this deformer. For this one, I just really wanna apply some simple bends here, so keeping it at its default is gonna be fine. Now after we have the deformer applied here, what we need to do is we need to select which points we wanna manipulate. And to do this, we can just click off and drag, and that's gonna clear the selected points. And then if we wanna select some, we can just hold control and then drag out and hold down Alt. And this will now give us a selection process. So that process again, just click off to deselect everything and then hold control and Alt, and it'll give you this white box and this will allow you to select. So now you can see I have these parts down here selected. So if I come here and scale, 
You see I'm only going to affect those shapes. So this is an easy way to come through and kind of manipulate your form. Now with this process, what I want to do is I want to select some points here and then say push these out. So I get this shape that's kind of crescent shaped, like almost like a moon. So I'm going to hold down Control and Alt and I'm going to select all these middle points here. And then I'm going to click and drag and just deform these out. So you can see I'm getting this type effect. And I'm going to scale this too and scaling will work as well. And so I'm just scaling and moving this until I get something that looks kind of like that. So now I have this little bended shape, right? Uh, yes, you can also uh, come in through and click and select points. So if you just want to select one point, control, alt, and click, and that will allow you to select one, and then you can just manipulate that single point. So I'm going to come down the bottom, control, alt, and click, get those bottom ones, scale this down. Oop, let's make sure I have that one cleared. So control will clear and control, alt, will select. So you can use that process. So I can manipulate this down, move it down a little bit. Then maybe I want to, you know, come through and scale this. So I don't want to be too crazy. And you can move these points to affect, you know, the entire way your mesh is handling. And so I can come through and massage these. If I had a little less control points, I could also um, manipulate this a little bit faster. So it just depends on what you're trying to get out of it. At this stage, just manipulating the shapes here. You can also rotate. So if I want to rotate this, get that kind of design out of it. Now I've got that happening. So now I've got this little leg shape. Now if you're happy with the deformation, just gonna go to the gear icon here and click accept. And then now you're going to have that as geometry again. You can now continue to deform this with just the Gizmo 3D, scale it down. I can position it to different areas. So let's see, I'm gonna get this as a little leg shape. So I'm gonna be positioning it here. And then I have something like that, and I'll position it off the side here. So just playing with that kind of silhouette and form, just blocking stuff out. Now, once again, you can always use the silhouette view here at the top and see a preview of what your model will be in that silhouette. So this is handy for just kind of getting another look on your mesh as well. Um, you can enlarge this by clicking and dragging and getting that a little bit bigger. The controls for the silhouette view live in preferences and then in the silhouette or the uh, thumbnail view right here and you have a silhouette mode you can toggle that on and off you can change the background the size of this the magnification so you can definitely get another view of your mesh while you're working to kind of hone in on those forms so we've got some questions here let me check on these so Paul chimed in and mentioned that his streams have been about rendering and he's doing a Part three of the rendering on Tuesday will be his next stream uh, covering that. So he'll always had, he's already had two uh, streams on rendering, so you can go back and watch those on YouTube and check out on those and catch up, and then part, he'll be doing part three on Tuesday. And once again, all these streams are live, so if you have questions, you can definitely ask him, and he's covering all the lighting stuff. Um, so you can definitely uh, hit him up in chat and uh, get that to uh, go through there. So Dougie, I see, I see your request. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put it down in the notes. I think we already have it though. It's, it's on the list already. Uh, Saeed's asking, can you set a, select a line to deform instead of a point? No, so it's all gonna be point based on that deformer. So when you have any of the points selected, that's what's driving that cage. But you can select multiple points, which is gonna give you kind of that line functionality. Um, it's up to Paul. I don't know if Paul's going to be covering a lot of the NPR rendering. He's definitely doing rendering, but I think he's been focusing more on uh, the photorealistic stuff. But if you're in the stream, Paul loves some tangents, so you can get in there and he may go on a tangent for you and cover, the, cover more of the NPR stuff. Uh, Fabian's asking, the object I generated a snapshot after I applied the bevel, the edges... Uh, will be due to the higher the type of geometry that's generated. So the bevels, the quality of the bevel is going to be determined about, definitely about how the geometry is created. So the snapshot 3D is going to, since most of the shapes you're making are going to be solid uh, concave or convex surfaces, that's going to work best with that control option with the bevel, and it's going to give you that kind of nice edge. If you have a convex, <laughs> I'm getting my, my convexes and concaves mixed up. If you have a concave surface and you use the bevel, the problem there is that 
the bevel process is going to take those poly groups and it's going to expand them out and then give you geometry between them. If your object is like this, when it expands out, they're going to cross. Okay. And so you're going to get something like this. It'll give you that bevel, but you may end up with topology that's now intersecting each other. Now you can go through and use, say, the Boolean process with uh, there's a former union by uh, remesh by union, and they'll come through and weld those points and give it back. But basically, that uh, little trick of going to the crease area, holding down control, and using this bevel width option is going to work best on convex surfaces because it's taking the polygroups, expanding them out and then adding geometry between those polygroups. And so the amount of topology will be uh, different there. So Paul did chime in and say that he will be covering NPR. And he's gonna be doing it in tomorrow's stream. So tune in, tune in, tune in. So Saeed's asking about, to briefly describe the design steps of stuff. So this just varies on what your goal is for the project. Um, so for like something like this, um, if I'm doing just an illustration, I'm not concerned about the topology that much, right? I'm concerned about what it looks like in 2D, what it looks like at this angle, something like that. So you can fake a lot of stuff in that aspect. So if I know that I'm just doing a render and I don't have to see the model from all angles, um, there's a lot of camera tricks you can do. You can float geometry places. You can do whatever you want basically in that, in your frame. And cause you're only going for that one scene. If you're doing something that's based like it's gonna be 3D printed out, you now have to worry about all angles of your mesh. And then you have to come in and make sure that looks good on all sides. You also have to make sure it's watertight. If you're doing say like a game thing, a game character, you now have to worry about low resolution. You have to worry about baking. You have to worry about what edges are gonna hold in that normal map if you're using normal maps. So there's just a lot of different processes <laughs> just depending on what the goal is. Um, for this stuff, this one here, basically I'm getting a silhouette, I'm gonna detail the silhouette and then I render it. So that's the steps for this one, but it all varies on what your end goal is. Oftentimes uh, models aren't, you can make a model which fits in all those scenarios, but there's a lot of like pre-thought you have to lock in because as we just mentioned, like if you have to have it 3D printed, it's gotta be solid. So you can't use like little tricks like single-sided geometry to get stuff, like it's not gonna happen. Um, so you kinda of have to build, you know, towards your goal is the, uh, the premise there. Uh, web watching is asking if you can change your silhouette from a different color. So it's going to do the opposite of whatever your background color is. So if you set your background to say orange, you say you're going to get blue. So this was just clicking and dragging to orange and you're going to get blue. So it's always going to do the opposite color. So whatever your background color is, it's going to give you opposite. So if I select black, I'm going to get white. So it's always going to do the opposite color. All right. So. Now I got this little leg here, but now I wanna add another part to this. So we're gonna go back into Spotlight and click Z. Let me get back in here. Click Z on my keyboard to get Spotlight back up. I'm gonna go and restore this part here. So I'm gonna just hit Control Z, which will now undo those changes to get back to a circle. Actually, I may want, yeah, we'll use this one. And now I'm gonna frame this to the area here. So I want some sort of like thigh mech part. So a large cylinder. So I'm gonna snapshot that. It's gonna give me my shape at this size because I had this subtool selected. I'm gonna use the Gizmo 3D and center it and then scale this out. Now, once again, I wanna apply that bevel first. I'm gonna the bevel there, hold down control and bevel this out a little bit. So now I have this tube shape and then scale it down some. And now I wanna go through and I wanna use uh, zero mesher again to give me some topology in the middle here so I can end up bending this as well. So going to the geometry area, going to zero mesher, and turn on keep groups and then click zero mesh. And now I have this and now I can use that same process with the deformer again. This time I'll use the bend option. So I'll come here to move and I'll click this, and now we'll do bend arc. And I'm gonna click and drag that. That's now gonna perform this operation. So I'm just bending along the arc. So I can get all the way down to a circle if needed. I'm gonna do kind of a half bend. Then I'm gonna accept this, and then now I can just my 3D rotate it, position it, scale it, and get it something like this. So just playing with the design here, and I may want it to be a little bit angled like that. And then this bottom leg's looking a bit too big now. So I'm gonna go and select that. 
scale this down, move it into position, maybe rotate it around. So maybe some sort of uh, kind of chicken leg type process here. So I want to add some connecting bits. So I get this to rotate slightly. And at this stage, I'm just playing with the shapes. And now that I have this on one side, I kind of just want to see what it looks like on the other side as well. So I can select one of these parts and then go to Tool, Geometry, and go to Modify Topology and click Mirror and Weld. If you only have one part on one side of the center world, so if I turn on Floor here, it's going to take this part and duplicate it over. So clicking Mirror and Weld will now give me two legs. And then if I select that other part, you can also hold Alt and click in the viewport here to select parts. So as I do this, you can see I'm changing my subtools and all I'm doing is holding down Alt and clicking in the canvas. So I have that part selected and select mirror and weld and now I have two of those and then I can continue to modify these as well. Now I wanna add another element to this. So this is gonna go into the process we did in one of the earlier streams as well, we were building with insert mesh brushes. An insert mesh brush allows you to take a part that's built into a brush library and apply it to the surface of your model. So I can come up here to the brush palette or press B on my keyboard. And let me move my keyboard. And in here, I can isolate by the brush name if I know what it is. Um, what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for the IMM model kit. So I can isolate by the letter I and then press K and that will allow me to select the model kit. So brushes inside of ZBrush have a hotkey format. So B, the first letter of the brush, and then there's a, another value that goes with it. So if you want to select the standard brush, you can press BST. And if I want to select this model kit, it was BIK. So all the brushes have that kind of functionality built in. The first stream I did on sculpting a bust went through that in a little more detail. So if you have any questions on that, you can rewatch that on YouTube. So now I'm gonna come up here to the top and this is a IMM viewer bar. And in here it's showing me all the parts that this brush contains. So I'm just looking for one specific one, this fastener seven, and I'm just going to select that. With that selected, I can now come across, say this mesh here, and I turned on symmetry by pressing X. And now if I click and drag, it's going to embed that part to my mesh, right? So it's just added that little piece there. And so now I have another element onto the surface of my model. Now, after you have that added, let's say I want to split that out to its own subtool. So I can go to the geometry or go tool, subtool. And then there's a split area down here and I can split the unmasked parts. So every time you use an IMM brush and draw a part on your model, it's going to come out unmasked and it's going to mask everything else that that subtool has. So using this split unmasked points is going to allow you to create a new subtool from the part you just generated. So there we've got something there. And now let's add one more part and then I'll go and hit up these questions again. So I'm gonna hit Z on my keyboard to get back to spotlight here. I wanna add a little greebly bit. So I'm gonna move my keyboard back up here. So I'm gonna grab this part and center it in the middle, zoom it up a little bit, use Christmas in the corner, extend it out some to get that kind of shape. And then I'm gonna kind of rotate this in place, scale it down to kind of see where I want to go. So I just wanna add some you know, some visual noise in this area here. So this would be the area where the joints would connect. So it would have some mechanical parts that would be living there. Um, just adding these really quick to just make a connection between those parts. After that's added, I'm gonna hit Shift Z to hide spotlight. Now I'm gonna rescale this down since it was based on that subtool I'd selected. Now I can turn off symmetry and move this into position. So say maybe position this here. I can now rotate this, just adding little of effect there and then I can duplicate this to the other side by going to geometry doing that mirror and weld now I have two of those now I want to add another element just on the back here so some kind of part that's coming off maybe I want to duplicate this too so I'm going to hold control maybe add a secondary part here and at this stage I'm just looking at the silhouette and moving things around so these don't have to be connected as we mentioned you know this isn't for 3D printing, it isn't for anything other than generating this image using NPR. So I'm free to just have things hanging out. They don't have to be connected. I'm just looking at the forms. So I'm gonna have one more part here. So back into Spotlight. We'll grab this one, center it, and they will rotate it 90 degrees. That looks pretty good. Add that one, Shift Z to get out. 
come down here, let me scale this a little bit. And all this is is just simple manipulation. So I'm using a lot of Gizmo 3D to move things around. I've used some of the deformers to add stuff. I'm just adding little elements there. So now I've got that, and then I'm mirror and welding to get to the other side. And so now I have this happening. And if I turn on perspective and kind of look around and see if that's working or not, manipulate, manipulate the shape a little bit more if needed. Maybe it's too wide. If you turn symmetry on and you start getting scaling like this, you can definitely click on local symmetry, which will apply the scale in a local way. So if you want to affect just the scale and not affect the parts together, enabling this local symmetry will allow you to change that. You can see I'm getting in my Bob Ross modeling voice. <laughs> Shifted from teaching to, to modeling. Happy trees. Happy trees. Happy IMMs. After you're uh, using this, you come here and hit quick save. Uh, you can save this out just to make sure you back up stuff. So this is the easy way to do that if you're a new time user. All right, so let's see what questions I got here. Um, what's the name of the tool row? So Andreas is asking, what's the name of the tool row that begins with the BPR icon? So this right here is called the um, IMM model viewer. And if you go to preferences and go to interface, IMM viewer is right here and you can disable this by clicking this option here. You can also change the placement. So if you don't want that going around, but this is gonna show all the different parts that's in one of those insert multi-mesh brush or IMM brushes. So it's the IMM viewer bar is what that is there. Andreas. Uh, silhouette. So, Madrash is asking, can you type in numbers in the deformers instead of dragging the cones? Uh, you cannot, so you can only use the cones to change those deformer settings. Uh, Zofo is asking what the adapt option is. So the adaptive size is gonna look at the topology on the surface of your mesh and try to give you an adaptive version of that size. So you may have polygons that are smaller in some areas and polygons are bigger. If you crank this up to 100, it's gonna to try to keep all those polygons the same size when you Z-remesh something. So you can just change the slider and click Z-remesh and you'll see the difference in those two. So adaptive size, if you have that low, it's gonna generate different sizes of polygons. If you have it high, it's gonna to try to keep polygons the same size. So if, if you wanna say like to have a cube, yeah, right, and you have a cube object and you go and you Z-remesh that, if your adaptive size is at default, you may end up on the edges where you'll have tiny polygons and in the middle you have bigger ones. But if you set that to 100 and then take that same cube, you're gonna pretty much get even topology all the way around. Uh, T. Garrity is asking how you can use the gizmo deformer on all parts in a folder. Um, you cannot. <laughs> so you would have to merge those together to use the deformers. The deformers will only work on a single subtool. You can use the gizmo to manipulate a mesh across multiple subtools. And that can be done by using this uh, transpose all selected subtools option here, or the pizza boxes. Um, and then also if you have a folder, uh, you can have it where the folder, you can select that to transpose and it'll give you the gizmo 3D and then you can move all those parts of the folders. But the deformers will not allow you to uh, manipulate multiple subtools. You have to merge those together. All right, so now that I've got this, I wanna add few more parts here and then I'm gonna go into a little more detailing. So I still got time, still got time. So one thing I wanna add is he needs some sort of head type shape. And then I wanna add some wires, okay? Uh, for these, what's under BPR, S-Picks? Andres is asking, he, he touched something and it may disappear. The S-Picks bar right here, that will set up the pixelation value um, for the BPR rendering, so it's gonna change your anti-aliasing. If you hold control over this, you can see this is where any object, you can kind of get information by holding control. So Andreas is asking, where is this option? So if you hover over control here, you can see that that option lives in render, BPR, render, pass, S picks. So if you've ended up losing it or changing your um, customized UI and then maybe remove something, uh, you can kind of get this back. Uh, for these whole thing removing, you can hold control and if you click and drag, it will slide this. So that may be how you got that whole thing disappearing. 
But in general, there's no easy way to remove that <laughs> toolbar. So you would have had to come through and kind of go through. If you hit tab, it'll go away too. So that potentially could be it. So if you hit tab on your keyboard, you'll hide. Or if you held down control and clicked and drag um, in kind of a blank space here, you'll get a little icon change. You'll be able to scroll this. So that could be also how, you know, maybe you scrolled it up or down too much and it disappeared. But it shouldn't just go away um, magically. Um, you can also uh, come up here and change your interface icons at the top. Tab. Tab was the answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, you can't really get rid of that easy. It would take some, take some process to come in and remove all of them. All right, so I got my shape. It's getting there. He's looking semi-robot-ish. I can come in and start moving these. I find stuff is not um, kind of flowing what I'm like, but for right now, it's fine. At an angle like, say, this, that's giving me kind of what I want silhouette-wise. And if I turn perspective on, that's giving me something I can work with. And I want to add a you know part here for a head. And so we're going to do this with snapshot again. I'm going to choose this object again. Scale it down, move it, I want to position it to the middle. So right now you can see I have all a bunch of mess in here in uh, Spotlight. So I'm going to reposition everything back by just clicking this. It's going to clean that up a little bit because these things like to float all over the place. Now you'll notice when I go to snap on this, it's snapping to the sub tool I've selected. So I can go to the middle of that one, scale it down a little bit, and I'm going to add that and then get out of Lightbox there. And now that should already be the tool I have selected, so I can move this up center to the middle of it, and then I can scale this out, and then rotate this some. So getting something like that, so some sort of weird mech shape there. So it's gonna be armless, has a weird head, it's got some uh, crazy legs. And once again, at this stage, I can come through and I can start modifying all these parts. So if I find something I don't like, I can definitely come in and mess with this some more. So maybe it was too tall, maybe a little bit squatter. So something like that. And now with this, what I wanna do is I wanna start applying some Booleans now. So, so far we've been going through and we've just been using uh, Spotlight to get our positive shapes. Now I wanna add some stuff to this with the Boolean system and we had a whole live session on just using booleans to kind of model stuff. And the thing that's handy about this is that it's another non-destructive workflow. And I come in and test shapes and designs and get a result out of it. And since I'm rendering with NPR, I don't have to convert this to geometry, so I can just leave it in that boolean form. And this will give me a lot of play with, you know, just getting that silhouette shape out of there. So I'm gonna just come in and just start taking some Boolean shapes and I'm gonna use just one of the default brushes and just start changing this model up. Now to activate the Boolean, uh, it's very simple. You just can come here and activate Live Boolean. And then when Live Boolean is active, ZBrush is gonna look at your subtool list here. And it's gonna go through and look at these little icons that's on each subtool. So as an example with this part here, if I wanna subtract something from this part, I can just take this one, I can duplicate it. So now I have two of these. On the second one, I can scale this down a little bit and then maybe out so it's going through that other shape. And now I can come over here and activate the subtraction option. And this is now going to give me that subtractive shape in preview. And this is all still happening in this MPR view. So as I do this, you can see I'm subtracting from that part and it's coming through and I'm getting a preview of it. And I can manipulate this and move it around. So if my robot wants to have something like that happening, maybe he only wants like half a head. Um, so you can come through and change the shape and form of this to get a different design. So this is really handy. And all I'm doing is manipulating this subtool. So if I turn on my polyframes, you can see I'm just moving this in space. And this is changing how that subtraction process is happening. So it's really handy um, using the Boolean along with Spotlight to get different mesh structures. Now you'll notice when I subtracted this, it's subtracting from this part and this part as well. So let's say I don't want the subtraction to happen at this part. I only want it to happen at this part, but not touch this one. And this is all gonna be based on the hierarchy of my subtool list. So if I come to my subtool list here, you can see that this subtool is down at the bottom and it's set to subtracting. So what it is going to do, it's going to look at all these tools. So it's gonna go through the list from top to bottom. It's gonna take this one, add, add, add. And then as it gets to this one, it's now gonna perform a subtract. So since this shape is above the subtractive form, it's going to automatically cut through. 
So if I don't want this shape to be modified by this subtool that I set to subtractive, I just need to move the shape below it, right? So then it's not going to have that cut happen to it. So if I come up here and I locate that shape, which is this one right here, I can now move this and you can just do this by clicking and dragging and I can move it down. And then I wanna get it below the subtractive one. And now if I rotate, you'll see it is no longer subtracting from that part. So it's only affecting the one here. And since this one's below it, that subtraction isn't gonna to happen to it. So to clarify that one more time, if I take this and I move it down, you can see now it's gonna subtract from that part since this part is above it. So it's looking at it and then it's subtracting from it. But if I move that subtractive one up and change that order, now I get a different result. So that way you can come through and decide, okay, what parts do I want subtracted from what? And you can isolate it based on the hierarchy of your subtool list. So with this now, I've just subtracted one part and now I wanna subtract some little more things. And this is gonna allow me to take my box model here and basically give it more design elements to it. So bring a little more uh, contrast to the surfaces, some more details. So here we go. So to do this, I'm gonna use another process that we covered in one of the earlier streams, and that's taking a IMM brush that is called the IMM Boolean brush. And so I'm gonna select this brush, and now I'm going to make sure I have a subtool selected. So we'll start with this one here. And with this, I'm gonna take the brush and I'm just gonna drag a part out. So actually, let's start with this one. So I'm gonna take this oval here, and what I wanna do with this is I wanna use this shape, which is basically this oval shape, and I wanna cut through this part. So I wanna cut a hole right through here. So if I click and drag on this part, you can see it's gonna draw this out. So this is drawing out that IMM part. And if I turn on perspective, or uh, symmetry by hitting X and draw this out, you can see this is what I'm getting here. So I'm getting this shape, it's drawing out on that subtool I'd selected, and it's coming in unmasked. So I wanna take this shape, I wanna set it to a subtractive element so it cuts out. So I'm gonna go back to that tool palette subtool area and I'm gonna do the split unmasked points, which is now gonna break off that insert mesh part as a new subtool. And then with this broken off, I'm gonna set it to subtractive and you can see now it's cutting through. Now I can manipulate this to make sure it goes a little bit further by using the Gizmo 3D and move it in. And then I can move it down and I can adjust this. And I've just taken that IMM Boolean brush and used it in a different way. So I didn't get those little oval shapes baked out, but I just used it as a cutter. So now that I have this subtool set up as subtractive, I can now start using the IMM brushes and it's gonna draw it out to the subtool that's already set as subtractive. And so whenever I do this, it's gonna allow me to get that same cut. So I'm using this Boolean brush. If I draw out something here, you can see I can start cutting with that, right? So I can start carving out different shapes. And all I'm doing is dragging out IMM parts onto the subtool that's set as subtractive. So if I wanna say add some more details here, so a good one for this would be this edge bar. I can come through and drag this out, and you can see as I drag this out, it's cutting through the surface, and that's giving me this little bar too. So I can manipulate this and move it, and now I've just added another element to my character. So before that was all boxy shapes, and now I've just added this Boolean as an IMM and subtracted from it. Now, if I turn on solo here, you can see this is what those parts look like. And the only difference here is that I've drawn them out and I've set them to subtractive. So I've set them to positive and you can see this is what they look like. And then this brush is set up to use all these as cut pieces. So whatever I select and come across my mesh, it's going to cut into that surface. Now we got to remember that the hierarchy of this is going to determine where these parts cut. So as we had before, this part is up here and then this part is below it, right? So this part's not gonna get affected by that cut. So if I come and try to drag something out on this part to cut in that surface, it's not gonna cut because this part is above that positive part. So if I wanted to cut out of there, I need to move this one down. And now if I apply this, you'll see it's gonna affect that tool as well. So just remember your hierarchy as you're doing this. And so with this, I'm gonna come through and just start adding some different elements. And this can totally change the shape of your mesh. So you can just quickly come through draw out IMM parts, maybe manipulate them, how they're going in different angles, and you can see you can start generating totally new looks for your design. And all I'm doing is adding these in this method.
Now this is non-destructive, so that means I can come through and remove these parts if I don't like them. But you can see how quickly I can come through and just add some different elements to my design. And all I'm doing is clicking and dragging. So nothing crazy, right? So I want these little lines here, maybe something like that. I want to add something here. Maybe I'll add this part right here. And then after these are added to the, you can always transform them with the Gizmo 3D since they will be unmasked. So I add this part here. And you can always undo and redo the process as well. And I'm still in that NPR view too. So as I'm doing this, I can see what it's gonna look like if rendered in that photorealistic or non-photorealistic process. Oops. Uh, so we got some questions here. Web etching, what if it's subtracting multiple tools? So if it's subtracting multiple tools, it's still gonna be hierarchy based. So if I add another tool underneath this and subtract it, it's still gonna subtract from that form. Um, you can separate how the hierarchy structure is. You can restart it basically um, by adding uh, folders to the mix or clicking this little icon here, which is going to set start groups. And this will go through and set those subtools to kind of reset. So reset your hierarchy. Um, so there's some videos on Z Classroom on using the uh, Boolean system. Uh, we'll go into more in depth of that with the start groups. For the basic stuff, I haven't been covering the uh, start groups because you really don't need them to generate a lot of stuff. You just need to think about your hierarchy and your subtool list from top to bottom and then where those cut processes happen. And then if you need to move them up or down, you can simply just go in and, and move those shapes. So it's not fully needed um, for a lot of stuff. But I'm just gonna come in and add a few more details here. So certain areas where I see that may need some love and just grabbing different shapes. Often when I do this too, I'll try not to use too many IMM parts because then it just looks like a chaotic mess. Um, so just coming in and try to isolate to a few parts and then you can always undo. So if you draw something out and then decide, hey, that isn't cool there, you can definitely move it to get a different form out of it. You can also delete it, undo um, a lot of different uh, options you have. Now, finally for this, what I'm gonna do is I wanna add these little kind of, um, kind of bolt pieces. And this is gonna add just some different elements to the side here. And so I just selected this MG dot and I'm gonna come through. Uh, while you're doing this, if you hold down control, this will lock it into a set size. So if I want all these to be the same size, um, just set your draw size to what you, what you want it to be, drag out and hold control, and that will lock it into that size. And now if I repeat this process elsewhere, drawing out, holding control, it's going to keep that same size. So this way I can go through and say add this little detail all over my model, and it's going to retain that size. So this way all these parts will look a little bit more cohesive. You can turn off symmetry too and add stuff, you know, asymmetrically, which is always nice. And maybe add a few more in here. Sad. That one. I'm gonna go to Bob Ross mode again. Happy little trees. Happy little trees. And you can see you can just quickly go through this pretty haphazardly too and add you know, a bunch of different elements. Um, it's often fun to create craziness too. So since this model is never gonna be uh, printed, you can come through and grab say like a shape like this indent and just go chaos, right? So I'm gonna come through and append in a temporary subtool here. So this star and with this star, I'm gonna set that to subtractive and now I can just experiment, right? So I can take this indent and as I drag it across the surface, it's now gonna cut in, right? because it's set up, that subtool set up as a Boolean there. Make sure I got symmetry on. And so now I can come through and just start experimenting too. And this ends up creating like some really nice happy accidents uh, as you're doing this, because you can come through and just start scrubbing your mesh. And if you just keep going with this, you can start getting some chaos. And then sometimes you end up getting little happy things that happen and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I just totally changed his leg. And since this is never going to be, you know, printed and it's only rendered, like you can see it happening in real time, right? So you can see it as this is happening, you can square stuff out, change the shapes. So if you want to do like something 
really, really different, maybe more weirdly sci-fi, not you know, something you normally see. You can definitely come in and play with the shapes. So now I've totally changed that entire mesh. And once again, this is non-destructive too. So if I come over here, I can, you know, remove this by either deleting the subtool or just simply turning it off. And then I can, you know, use this as a state. Like, well, let's see, maybe I like that. It's generating some weird silhouettes. Maybe I don't like it and turn it off. So lots of happy accidents, uh, stuff you can get built out of this. So the one last thing I want to do this before we get into the painting process here is I want to add some wires. So right now we're looking very boxy and I want to add some, you know, different lines and stuff through here. And with this, I want these lines to look, you know, a little bit painted because uh, the object here is to make this kind of NPR uh, asset. And so I want to add, you know, some little lines through here, just get a little wire effect, right? So maybe I want a bunch of wires here, some coming off the back to fill in this kind of hole, maybe some through here. So a little bit of kind of wispy, wiry, maybe some antennas that are coming off the top. And so for this, what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna go back into Spotlight again. And so I'm gonna hit Z to bring Spotlight back. And I wanna first select a Spotlight uh, part that I don't really care about. So I'm gonna select this one here. And now I want to come over here and there's a duplicate functionality. And this is going to take whatever spotlight alpha I've selected and it's going to allow me to duplicate it. So I'm going to click that and now it's going to give me a new one. Now with this duplicate version, I'm going to size this up. And if you hold down shift, it'll size up to the max size that the alpha was created at. And then with this sized up, I now want to erase what's in this area here. And then I want to be able to draw some wires. So to erase what's in the alpha, if you click the paint option and enable paint and then click and drag, you can see the spotlight wheel here is gonna move. And as I do this, it's gonna go from black to white to clear. So it just erased that alpha. If you don't wanna erase that alpha or you wanna bring it back, you can just take control Z. But if you've duplicated it, you already have your alpha over here. So you can just come over here, activate the paint, click and drag. This will clear that alpha out and now give me a blank alpha. Now that I have a blank alpha, I can position this somewhere on my mesh, right? So maybe I can put it right here. And then I'm gonna make sure if that paint is active, I can move the spotlight wheel off, just make sure paint's still active. And now with this off, what I can do now is if I come across this blank alpha, since I have paint on, if I click and drag, I'm gonna be able to draw, right? So now I'm drawing alphas on the canvas here. And this is gonna allow me to come in and draw these little wire shapes here. So I can come through and just start manipulating these. And I can make these pretty loose. I can hold down Alt to erase you know, if I want them to have you know, certain elements to it. But this will allow you to experiment with just these wires, right? So they're gonna be, you know, loose all over the place. I don't want them to have like a hard surface or something that looks like it's been, you know, constructed or um, built with a lot of time. I want it to be like a loose line drawing to kind of give that believability of this being drawn rather than a 3D model that's been converted to a drawing. So just going through and applying, you know, loose strokes to generate some wires. After I'm happy with these, I can hit that snapshot 3D button and I'm gonna get a new subtool. Um, I wanna add some more to this. So I'm going to take my uh, snapshot box here. I'm gonna go back into the center here and move this up. I'm gonna erase this one since I already got some wires on that. So clicking the paintbrush icon, rotating and clearing that out. And then I'm going to reposition this to say this area. I'm gonna now move the spotlight wheel off, make sure I have paint selected. I'm gonna add some wiring through here. Just playing with the things. And I don't want any of these really to cross because I want to be able to manipulate them uh, afterwards as well. So I, I want to be able to deform these wires after I'm done with it. And if you don't like any of these, you can undo. One might be okay right there. And I'm not happy with any of the other ones. Uh, then I can create that. And then I can now manipulate this again. So move this over here. See if that one would work over there. I could even modify this. Now to erase this part, maybe generate that. So now I got another wire part there. And then maybe rotate that some. So you can always manipulate this as you're doing this process. And it's really handy. Um, you can also use any of this stuff here so you can extend things, grow things, create more complex wires. And all I'm doing is just manipulating these alphas and then generating them geometry. So simplistic stuff. And then for the wires on the head, kind of same thing. So I just want to make some you know, strands that come out. So I'm gonna frame this here. I'm gonna clear the image again. Make sure I have paint on still, move it off. And now draw a little bit of weird wires here. So 
So maybe he's got some antennas like that and then create those as well. Now I'm gonna get out of spotlight and you can see this is what I have created. So it's gone through, I have three subtools and it's done the size once again in the Z depth based on the subtool I'd selected. So that subtool I selected was pretty wide. So these are, you know, quite substantial hanging out here. But I can use the Gizmo 3D and uh, center on that, turn off symmetry, scale these down, make them more wiry. So increasing their depth to get them down to something like that. And then I can now position these to one side and then I can use the move brush. So I hit B, M, V on my keyboard to select move. And now I can come through and I can just position these. And so I want this to be rough again, so I'm not really concerned about a lot of the geometry connectivity here. This isn't gonna be printed, isn't gonna be made anything else other than a 2D image. So I'm just moving stuff around. There's also a brush you can use that is called Move Topological, which will help in this. So you can see all these are going together as I perform that move. If I wanna kind of move them separately, I can go to the brush palette over here and isolate by the letter M. And there is a Move Topological brush. And this one will allow me to manipulate these geometry islands. So I can now move one of these and it's gonna look at that topology and it's not gonna allow me to kind of mess up or move things that I don't want. So now I can come through and just play with these, mess with those wires some, and all I'm doing is just manipulating these. And this is very, you know, a very kind of dirty process here. So this is not anything neat and clean. I'm just trying to get a silhouette or a shape out of this. You can smooth these out too by holding down shift. And they'll soften those up some. Hold alt, click the next part, scale that down. and then move these as well. Sometimes you may want more of these too, so you have one on one side and then you can do another, so you can hold down control and duplicate that part. And then when you do this, you probably wanna offset it some and scale it down a little bit, just so it doesn't look like they're you know, sitting in the same space. And then we can use the move topological again to conform how those are. And you can start to see how this is starting to generate this wire effect. So Saeed is asking, is there a way to keep the color effect from the Boolean subtool on the model? So for the most part, the color you have on a mesh when you apply the Boolean, um, it will attempt to retain it. However, where those Boolean options intersect, it's gonna generate new topology. And so if you're using something like this and that where these have long triangles, the colorization of your model is always gonna be based around the vertices. So if you don't have any vertices on your mesh, that color is gonna skew. Um, so if I tried to paint these and try to put a you know, dark paint here, I'm gonna get a gradient that's gonna go across. And that's the same thing that's gonna happen if you have a colorized model and you run it through the Boolean process. So wherever that stuff happens, it's gonna generate triangles and it, those color areas that are intersecting, it may not know what to do with that color. So you may have to go back in and repaint those areas. Um, so it is possible to retain the color. In uh, Spotlight, there is a project, or in Lightbox, there's a project in the Boolean area. Let's find out where that is, where'd I put it? And in here, there is a screwdriver example file, and that one has color and materials applied to it. So you can load that up and process it with the Boolean and you can see the result. So it is possible that it will be retained. They just have to have enough geometry to support that because where that stuff intersects, you could get color skewing after it, but uh, you can get it to work. All right, so I'm gonna come through and just manipulate these last parts here. So a question about changing the, the material. So right now we're in Skin Shade 5 because we're doing NPR. So this is on purpose, it's on purpose. So I'm not changing the material on this one, sorry. Sorry. But yeah, you could always, you could change to a different material as you're doing this. And then go back to that move topological brush, moving this stuff out. Selecting these antennas, scaling them down a little bit. They're a little bit too thick. There we go. Repositioning these a little bit to one side. This is just playing with the form. Now, as I'm doing this, you can see in the, you know, the preview up here, I'm getting a silhouette check too. So I can kind of see what wires are working or what not or not. And so I can add more to these two. So if I take this one, you know, I can position it to one side here and duplicate it and then manipulate this to get 
another wire effect there. And so now I'm adding more, you know, silhouette shape to that, right? So this mess right here is still looking like one-sided singular. So I'm going to duplicate that and get another one and then just move it over here. And then I can mirror that side as well too. So deformation, mirror that over, just reposition it. And then now I can distort this one. So it's offset some, just doing simple transformations usually works pretty well too. And then you can just come back in and use that move topological to move those around. And then you can check your front silhouettes too. So you really can just play with this quite a bit. But once again, remember that whole goal of this is I'm gonna make basically a 2D image, so I'm not concerned about all the way around. So it's just manipulating the angles I know that I'm gonna use. All right, so now that I got my wires, I've got my details here. Now I'm gonna go back to uh, do some painting here and I wanna establish some first some colorization values on this. And I have a color palette that I've grabbed uh, earlier that I wanna use with this. And oftentimes when I do color information stuff, I'll use a site called Adobe Color and this allows you to grab, say, palettes of color information that people find appealing. So if you're doing a project, it helps, you know, just to add another elements of um, appeal if someone already if you already have a crowdsource kind of system that's saying hey these colors you know this five colors here that's in this palette people really like you've got 900 votes saying oh those colors are awesome put them on your model it's going to help you make your model a little more appealing if people already know they like something adding elements to your model that people like are going to help grab appeal to it so one thing there with color. So I have an image that I have in a light box here. And let me move my keyboard here. I'm probably gonna remove these number keys eventually from this keyboard and make it a little bit smaller since I haven't been hitting those. I thought initially when I did this, I was like, I use those quite a bit. And then <laughs> during these streams, I haven't touched them. So I'm gonna condense this down at some point. Um, in the texture folder here, I have some textures that I've loaded in. And one of these is this Make sure I actually loaded it in here. It's in here somewhere. Oh man, maybe I didn't. Maybe I failed. Maybe I failed. All right, we're gonna have to load it in another way. All right, so I'm gonna load in my texture. So I'm gonna texture palette and go to import. And then we're going to, I swear I put it in here. Negative, negative on the automatic loading. So if you put any texture images into your ZBrush 2020.1.3 folder, it's a Z texture folder, and these will allow these textures to be loaded in the light box. So you can actually open these up real quick and double click them and then you'll get the parts in. Um, I obviously did not do that correctly, so I need to navigate and get my colors here. And so I just imported those in. Now these are imported in, they're in the texture palette here. And what I want to do is I just want to make a dummy object and apply this to it so then I can color pick from it. Now I could open this up and then as I hover over these, I could press C and you'll see this will grab those colors from the UI, except this is really tiny and it's kind of hard to grab colors from. So what I want to do is I want to come over here to the tool palette. I'm going to select a uh, plain 3D object, which is going to give me this. I'm going to turn this to a poly mesh and make sure it's on my screen here. Let me redraw this out. So there's my plain 3D object. And then I'm gonna go down to the texture area way down at the bottom, and I'm gonna link that color thing there. So now I have my textures in my scene. And now I can place this anywhere in the canvas. And this is another thing, we talked about that snapshot option initially uh, that you may run into where you hit Shift S on your keyboard and it'll create a clone or duplicate of your model. Uh, another good thing for it is that you can take, you know, a tool like this and I can put it over here and I can hit Shift S and now I'll leave it there. And so now if I go back to the tool palette and now select my robot, I have my robot in my scene and now I have my color palette. So I can come over here and hit C and it's gonna allow me to pick those colors really quick. Okay, so you can use this to your advantage by using just snapshot to place something down on the canvas and now I can shift through the colors. 
So for my mech here, I'm gonna start applying some base colors to this. And this is just gonna be color fills based on the geometry I have. So a lot of this topology stuff here is um, using that snapshot 3D element. So some of these uh, colors here, um, they're just gonna flood. So I just wanna flood the colors. I can get a you know, quick view of what this model is gonna look like with you know, certain colors very quickly. And I can find if there's one that would serve better as a base color than others. So like this one here is pretty good. This one's actually probably the one to go with. Um, but you can come through and you can kind of just set these and see what your base color would look like. Now, in addition to this, I'm gonna change my uh, background color back to more of a white color so I can get more of that preview in which I had with that NPR rendering. So now I'm getting this. And I'm gonna check those colors again just to see what's reading better. So actually this one is, is actually doing a little bit better here than the other ones. So this will be, uh, so we got questions, is this vertex painting? Yes, so we will be doing vertex painting or poly painting as what we call it inside a ZBrush. And this is gonna fill the vertices of our model with color. So right now, as I'm choosing a primary color here, you can see that my model is changing it. So whatever color I select, my model is switching to that color. And that is because currently all the subtools in my scene here do not have the vertex color enabled. So it's just taking whatever color I currently have selected and applying it globally to all my subtools. So I wanna go through and I want to turn on the paintbrush icon or the colorize option for all these subtools. And then I can go through and apply that vertex color to those. So by default, if you come over and activate a paintbrush icon, so let's say, I'm gonna turn this black really quick here. And I come to those wires and I turn on this. Actually, let me go to, a, let's go to this subtool. And I activate the vertex color. It's gonna by default be white. So it's gonna automatically come in and set the color of your model to white. So as I turn this on, and if I turn on the next one, you can see that I'm gonna start getting that color as or that vertex color turned on, and it's gonna automatically fill it with white. If I wanna go through and turn on every single one of these subtools to have that vertex color enabled, you just need to hold down shift and then click on the paintbrush icon, and now everything has had vertex color turned on, and you can see it's defaulted to that white color. So now if I change my color over here, you can see that since Vertex's color is turned on and all these subtools had white applied to it, now when I change the stuff over here, you can see nothing's happening. But if I say come through and say grab this tool and turn off its paintbrush and now come over and modify this, it's gonna take that primary color again. So this is a fun way to experiment too. If you wanna experiment with different color schemes, you can just disable the paintbrush icon on some subtools, change the color, and then you'll see it update right on screen. So what I wanna do is I wanna have these all filled with white and then I'm gonna go through and I wanna start processing these with some of these other colors. So there's a uh, ways you can do this in the Z plugin area up the top here. There's a um, subtool master here, which has some different options where you can apply color to models across everything. Um, so if I click this, I think it's in here. It better be in here. Actually, I'm not aligned. Let's see here. Yeah, so there's a fill all visible color subtool option here. And what this will do is instead of me going to each one and filling with a color, I can fill it everything globally. So let's say I want this to be my base color. I'm just make sure that's selected. And now I'm gonna go to the Z plugin tab and now I'm gonna click the um, fill option. And it's gonna ask me if I wanna fill color material or color material. So for this, I just want color. I don't want the material filled. I just want color, so make sure that's on. And then I'm gonna click okay. This is now gonna process and you're gonna see all those subtools are gonna change for my eyes, right? So now I have all these filled with that color. Now, if you have any masking on your tools, so like this one here had some masking applied, it's only going to apply that fill to areas of your model that was unmasked. So you may wanna make sure that you have masking cleared on your mesh before you do that color fill option in the Z plugin tab. Or if you're over here in the document color area, there's a fill object here, which will also fill with color. And then this one, my chaos, my chaos group here, We'll fill that one too. We may delete this, but we're gonna keep it for right now. And then I'm just going through on the parts that contain those IMM subtools. So like these wires or say like these parts through here and just make sure my masking is cleared and then I'm just filling that object with color. Now if I get out of solo, you can see now everything has that color value assigned to it. Maybe except for this one. Let's try that one more time. There we go. 
So now that I have this, I want to go through and I just want to break it up into colors quickly. So to do this, I'm just going to select subtools, pick another color and fill. So for the wires, I know I want all the wires to be a dark color, right? So I'm going to hold alt click or click a subtool over here. I'm now going to hover over this color that's been locked into 2.5D and hit C to select it. And then I'm going to go to color fill object. And that will now fill those wires with black. And I'm just going to do that same process where I'm going through each of the wires. Now, if you know your wires are always going to be that same color, you can also come through and just merge all these subtools together. So there's no reason for me right now to spend time switching between these wire subtools. I'm happy with where they're at. I know I just want them all the same color. So I'm going to merge all these down. So to do this, I'm going to select the top one in this list. These are all wires. And then I'm going to go to the tool subtool merge area and I'm going to do a merge down. Now every time I do a merge down it's going to take that and merge it down to the one below it. So I can just come through and do this quickly and merge all those wires together and now I can do that color fill object once instead of multiple times and you can see all those wires have been updated. Now for the next tools I want to add you know a little variation so once again I can come up and you know turn off different parts and then the paintbrush icon on different parts and see what it looks like in a different color. So that area looks kind of good with that. So I'm going to select that one and now do color fill object. And that's now going to replace that white with that color. For these IMM parts, I was using a subtraction. Remember that the cut effect is going to display the color that's on them, not the part you're cutting into. So you can see right now I'm getting this tonal value of different colors. So this part I filled with that color, but then these other parts like this one here is actually pulling color from this object. So in order to change the color on those, I would have to come through and you know select that and then change the color. So if I want all those areas to be kind of dark toned or maybe that color, I just select that color and now color fill object. And now it's now taking those little parts there that are giving me those cuts and now I have those filled in. I'm gonna change a few more colors of these. So I'm gonna grab this one here. Maybe well, this one would be this kind of red color. Let's see what that looks like. And then we're gonna color fill object that. And then maybe this one up here too. So select that one, fill object on that. And see now I'm starting getting this different coloration. For the bottom leg, let's go to say that color. And all I'm doing is switch colors. I'm coming over here and hitting C on the keyboard and that's picking up that color. And so you can spend quite some time uh, going through and playing with the color options. I'm just kind of breaking these up quickly to get you know, a little different style through here. So we're going to hold there for this one because I'm getting close to the time mark here. And now the next thing I want to show is that the, the model right now, I want to paint some more details to it. So right now, even if I come through and say render, let's see what it looks like with BPR. This one may give me the, so I'm getting this kind of line effect, right? And I can come through and start uh, seeing what it looks like with different filters too. So this looks, you know, Decent, but it doesn't have that full believability to it. So I can try different filters by hitting comma to open up Lightbox. I'll switch this down to that size one. Let me move my model so I can see it. And then navigate to the filter area and I can start drawing different ones. So render with BPR. And I can go through and try. And let's see what it looked like with that charcoal one. So now that's definitely more drawing looking, but it's not really showing those colors I just established. Uh, we can have some sort of uh, sketch stuff. And so I'm just going through these and just seeing what they look like to see if I'm getting anything that I kind of like. So this one's giving a really cool effect. So you can see it's now giving this kind of really hatched kind of look. It's also pulling in those color information, but it may be a little bit too much. So you can say, just change the size of this model on screen and kind of test it at different angles and see if that's something that you really want or not. So that looks pretty cool, but I'm losing a lot of the form there. So this would be a good kind of underpainting so I could export this out and then refine stuff on in Photoshop and 2D if I wanted to. That one's a little bit too crazy. This one's got some nice uh, line stuff going on it. So the dark ink's looking like. I'm gonna try this paint effect one. So this one's looking more kind of where I wanna go with it. So we're gonna keep it on that one for now. And you can basically try all these out and see what they look like. So this one's got some nice kind of deviated surfaces. So all I did was model this object and then now I've just been rendering it with this NPR filter. So this looks, you know, pretty decent, but it still has some elements to it that are reading, you know, as a little bit of 3D. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to add another element on top of my model here to kind of 
make it more believable that it could potentially have been drawn. And with this, I'm going to start painting with this vertex color and I'm gonna start using brushes in kind of a haphazard form. Like what I would do, if, say, if I was watercoloring this or like applying, you know, rough paint strokes. So roughing up the surface with just color. And what I'm doing, gonna do with this is I'm just doing it on the model itself. So as an example with this part here, right? If I go into solo, this is what this part is. And so let's say I want to now take my color and I wanna start, you know, adding some different color elements to it. So if I bring everything back, let's say I wanna pull this color here and maybe apply it here some. So roughen this up, add some stuff where maybe I had some highlights, maybe some little details, things like that that are on this piece. So if I come through and now select the paintbrush, just hitting P on my keyboard and then A, so BPA will give you the paintbrush. I can now take my draw size down and I can come through and I just start painting with color. And as I paint, say on this area, you see I'm getting a good kind of result here. But as my line is coming across this edge there, you can see I'm getting this interesting gradient, which might be cool, might be what you want, but I'm not gonna be able to get any detail through here because this is spotlight geometry and I have no tessellation through here. So I've got tessellation on the ends, which is gonna support that vertex coloring or that poly paint, but I have nothing in between. So I need to add some tessellation to my mesh to allow me to paint, right? So I could come down here and I could go to the tool geometry area and use the remesher, which would give me that new surface, which is what we did to use those deformers to bend things. So that's definitely a process we can do. Um, we can also use DynaMesh as well and just DynaMesh the model. Um, it really depends at this stage, you know, what you want to use. The zero mesher will give you a little cleaner result, but you may actually have to divide the mesh up because it's made to, zero mesh is made basically to make a low res version of your mesh. Um, so it's, you're going to have larger pieces of geometry and you're going to need them pretty small to apply that paint detail. So what I'm going to go with this part is I'm just going to use DynaMesh. So I'm going to come over here and set my resolution to say 256 and then DynaMesh that part. And we'll let this process. Unless I did something weird here. There we go. And so now this has enough resolution all the way through it. So it's DynaMeshed it uh, and it's now giving me geometry. So now if I paint, you see it's gonna give me a nice stroke all the way across. So now I can go back to my model here. I can kind of frame it in that kind of angle I'm looking about. And now I can start doing this. Now the stroke I'm applying right now, it's, you know, it's very soft. So it's still looking a little bit too organic. So I'm gonna come to the alpha tab here and I'm gonna grab one of these alphas, say like 58. And now if I apply this, I'm getting more of this kind of stroke, which may work, but then I'd have this kind of really sketchy area on part of the mesh, but then on everything else, if I render it, it's not matching, right? So I wanna make sure I have something that I'm doing to this paint that's matching what I already have. And for this, I want kind of solid colors. So like if I just had like large strokes of just color and then they're kind of opaque and I can layer them up on top. So I'm gonna go to the alpha palette here and I'm gonna select a square alpha, like something like alpha 28. And so this is giving me, you know, a little better result, but the edges are a little bit soft. So I'm gonna adjust my focal shift at the top here, which will now square that out. So now I'm getting more of this kind of effect. So I'm getting this tighter edge around the corner there, which is giving me more of that kind of painterly feel I want. And then in addition to this, I can go to the alpha palette and in the, <clears throat> uh, where's it at here? Modify area, there is this. Maybe, maybe I'm in the wrong menu. Hold on. So many menus. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yes, I was in the right one. All right, in the alpha palette, and with this alpha I've selected, there's a streak length option. And if I change this, you can see my alpha up here is gonna be modified and it's now getting streaks, right? I can change this and get more density to it. I can change the intensity on this. And what this is gonna allow me to do, it's allowing me to get a kind of a weird fall off on this alpha. So I'm just modifying that square stroke and now I'm getting this little brush trailing, right? So now if I use this, I should get a little bit of a rough edge as it's drawn out. So this is gonna give me more of that paint feel on the surface. And now with this, what I end up doing is I just go through and start you know, generating different effects. So if I want, say, a line through here, add that in. If I wanna bleed stuff back out, I can hold C to color pick off anything on my screen and then I can apply it back out. And so you can come through and just start playing with your design some and kind of highlighting different areas. So maybe I want something like this. And all I'm doing is hitting C to switch my coloring on this. And I'm just generating rough 
kind of strokes and designs. And this is all I want to do here. So I want to, I'm bringing in that kind of believability that, hey, this could have been, you know, generated uh, by hand rather than digitally. And so this is the kind of the effect or process of this. And I do this across, say, all the different parts. If I want, you know, gray values to come up to add little stuff, just using this effect. And so you see now I'm getting that area is not looking, you know, as um, computer generated. It's not looking as thick. It's adding some more elements of, say, streaks and stuff to it. And so now when I render, it's looking rougher, right? So this stuff through here is looking more plausible as something that would have been drawn, right? So I have this kind of roughness and this kind of happy accident or errors that brings natural stuff into it. So it's not that exactness of having a computer generated image. You're coming in and you're adding these mistakes basically, and that's making it more believable. Um, so think of it as like just adding those elements in nature. Um, once again, if you want to save at any time, just come here and quick save, and that'll save everything in your scene. And then you can open this back up by going to Lightbox. And then if you go to the quick save folder, your quick saves will be baked in there. Now I'm going to jump ahead to a version of this model that has been painted already. So we're going to go to my project tab here and go back to this view and I'll show you uh, some examples of this. So in this mech illustration one here, this one uh, is a first a crazy one that uh, I liked and we're going to load it in because it kind of hints at, you know, just stuff you can do really quick and get weird, weird results. So this one uh, was just, taken quickly, right? So I just made some shapes using the same process we just did. And then you can see I went nuts with um, the Boolean system, right? So I have this whole subtool that's just generating this crazy mess. So it was just taking stuff and just slamming it into the topology and it's generating all these cut lines. And now if I render this, you're gonna see I'm gonna get this, you know, kind of stylized work to it, right? So this was taking that mess and now I've added this to it. So it's definitely fun to play with and using it in this NPR way, you can get these really, really crazy results out of it. Um, so this one was just, it started out really clean and then just went in really quick and just added stuff. And now I have this like happy accident um, mech here out of nowhere. So really fun to play with. And then once again, since it's in 3D, I can move this around, I can rotate it, I can change the different angles on it and then get different renders. So if you wanna do say like a comic book or something, you can model one character and then simply move it around. Now you have multiple frames. So you're not redrawing uh, every frame of your design. Um, so it ends up giving some cool stuff. Uh, another one here I have, that's my messy mech. This one is the final version of that other mech. So basically the same shapes here. And if I zoom out you see, this is what this one looks like. And this is all just, you know, same process I just did. So I just used the Boolean options for a lot of this. I've gone through and added, you know, these different 2D elements just using snapshot. And these also, you know, can be used to help, you know, rein in some believability that's drawn too. So adding elements in a 2D plane. Now this model will never be, you know, generated in a uh, 3D printed fashion or anything like that because it's a mess, right? So I have stuff floating all over the place. You can see stuff's like 100% angle based. So especially like these little uh, kind of kicks of dirt on the bottom. So as you can see, as I, if I focus it this way, this actually ends up working or making you know, more sense than if it was at another angle. But you can see now I have this kind of believability that, hey, this could have been uh, you know, drawn rather than uh, rendered in 3D. And so I have these little different things here. I can turn on and off and get different uh, stuff out of it like that, right? And now once again, this is also, you know, can be rendered. So if I come up here and click BPR, this is just preview right now. So this is just in ZBrush. This is just how it looks. All these are simple, you know, subtool objects I've just painted on. So this is that same process. I just made an alpha, distorted it to give it roughness, and then came over and just painted, just added that other element to it. So if I want to change any of this, I can hit C, you know, and scrub stuff off really easily. And now after I have this, I can render with BPR and see what this looks like. Um, the words for this one, so you have a question about the words that were just done with that uh, spotlight process. Um, so I went in and here yeah, I can do it really quick. So if we go back to spotlight, I'm not going to switch my background so you guys are going to have to, well maybe I need to switch my background. Hold on so you guys can see this. 
So basically I took a alpha in here. So this is my one example one here. And I first cleared it out. So I went to the paintbrush icon and activated it and then clicked and dragged. And this will erase basically the alpha. So it's gonna fill it with white. And then when it reaches the pinnacle of white, it'll remove everything. Now, once I have this alpha cleared, I can move my spotlight wheel off. And if I make sure I have this paintbrush icon on, I can now come in here and paint. And so I can do, and that's gonna generate that. And then I can turn it in geometry by clicking this. And now I have that text created. So that is how I made the text, same with the wires. So I just used a uh, spotlight and I just drew on a blank one with the pen tool. And then that gave me that geometry. And then I took that, uh, used snapshot 3D to convert to geometry. And then I just manipulated it in my scene. So that's all that was for that. And then we go back to my document color here, which is, let's go back to white again, white-ish. And so now with my robot here, we can go through the filters too and see what we'd look like in different filters results. So I have them in this version and he's just in preview, which is looking pretty good. Let's see what I like, Let's see what he looks like with um, different filters. So hitting comma on my keyboard again or going into light box. I'm gonna shrink this down to one row so I can see the model here as I go through this. I'm gonna go to the filters tab, make sure I'm rendered in BPR and then I'm gonna start applying filters and see the different results I get on this. So that was a little bit too dark. And so once again, just to try different ones, let's just come up here and click. And so you can see like, now I have this kind of design, right? So I have these like little cross hatched areas here. If I turn off my floor, I wouldn't get this uh, crazy floor background. So let me turn that off. So there you go, I got that. And just go through and double click these and see if you find anything else you like. So you may have like that one's pretty good, right? You can see what it looks like at a different angle. Re-render. These are all just using the filters. And these are all the filters that are uh, preset inside of ZBrush. So after you make something, you can just try different ones. Let's try that charcoal one. This is probably gonna be too much. It can be in the children's book. And then some of these, if you see, uh, some of them actually look like the, um, the model. So they're actually, <laughs> I was using this model when I created some of these. So this one's pretty awesome looking. And so it's got this like weird kind of line quality to it and it's kind of bleached out, which is giving a nice effect. And then after you're happy with any of these that you find, uh, you can just export these models out or export the images out. But there's a lot of them in here you can play with. This one gives a cool result too sometimes. That one's a little bit messy. But you can just see how like just that filter changed the entire thing. And so you have a lot of you know freedom and control to kind of mess with stuff. And then if I want a different angle, it's very easy to get if I can rotate correctly. And then maybe I don't want that text, so I have it as a layer or a sub-tool, so I just turn it off. And maybe I'll bring back in the ZBrush one. And then you get that. Uh, so got a few questions here, and then it's almost time for this to be done. So let's go through these quick. Uh, Andreas is asking, would Testimate work to add topology to your model for painting? Yes, it would. You could also use Sculptress Pro. That would work as well. Um, so you have all those different options. Uh, got the word one. Can you export on image with an alpha? So you can, when you do a render pass, it will give you in the render render area, you'll have a mask area here um, that can be dumped out separately. You will have to combine them. It will not generate a uh, combined mask for that. The only thing with this mask as well is that these BPR filters are going to be applied after the mask. So it's going to be applied on the canvas. So basically it's rendering your model and then applying the filter on top of it. Um, so when you get this image out, if you just export through document, export here, it's just going to give you this. Now you can use, say, there's a Z plugin here that will allow you to send what you see in here to ZBrush. So there's a ZBrush to Photoshop plugin here. This will allow you to get the mask and also the um, 
Albedo if you want it, and the BPR render, which is what I'm currently seeing on screen. And you can dump those all out directly into Photoshop. So that's a one-click process. You just send to Photoshop and it will come through and grab all those passes and open them up in Photoshop for you. However, with that mask, the mask is gonna be looking at the version of your model without all the filter. So if I click here, this is what's gonna get the mask generated around. Okay, so it's gonna give you a mask layer that's generated around this shape, but it's not gonna take into effect the BPR filtering that applied afterwards, if that makes any sense. So it's not gonna get these little kind of nice little happy things that are happening along the edge of the mesh here. Uh, another thing with the filters too is that the resolution of some of the effects you're gonna get is gonna be based on the size of your screen that you're dumping stuff out. So if you render at a certain screen resolution, you may get some really cool stuff, but then if you try to make a larger image or maybe change your um, setup, so say you had, I'm on a laptop now, if I open this up inside uh, my desktop at home, it may end up giving me a little different look. The filter will still be applied, but the scale of that filter effect may change. But that's the uh, stuff there. Um, for the stroke options, uh, you can definitely uh, save anything you have changed over here. So if I've modified everything in the brush palette or changed, say, the alpha over here, you can definitely save that out. So go brush, save as, and you can save out a brush preset, and then you can reload that stuff in. Um, that should save the uh, intensity, the draw size, and I believe the focal shift as well. So you can definitely have that all set up and be ready to go. So is there any other questions quick? So I hope this gave some insight on to how you can kind of use ZBrush to generate uh, some 2D uh, illustration stuff and using the NPR system. Uh, we just went through basically the just preset version of this. Um, Paul, as he mentioned, if you guys were here in the stream, guys and gals were here in the stream earlier, is doing a whole thing right now on rendering. So he will be streaming tomorrow and he'll be covering more of the NPR stuff in depth. So he'll be going through all the crazy little things here that live in the render BPR filters area. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, and Paul will be hitting on that and showing you guys how to customize those filters, which you can then save as your own presets. Um, but for this one, I just wanted to have you guys, you know, going through the process of using, you know, Spotlight to generate stuff, then coming in, using some Boolean stuff to add some details, painting some stuff quickly, and then using the filters to generate a result. So kind of that process trying not to make it overly complex. Um, this is definitely more complex than some of the other uh, Z Classroom live streams. So definitely um, it will take a little bit of uh, a learning curve to get some of this stuff down, but the results are pretty powerful and you get uh, some really nice uh, stuff out of it. Um, for Friday, I'm gonna be going into a, another kind of upper level kind of ZBrush learning stuff. We'll still do the start to finish type process. Um, but with that, we're gonna go into the project primitive deformer. And that deformer is the most complicated deformer um, inside this little area here. So it's just called Project Primitive. Um, it is very complex. Um, we're going to go through, try to go through it simply to generate some stuff because it makes some really nice uh, happy accident results. And you get some really cool design elements out of it. So we'll, Friday I'll be focusing on that and covering the deformer and Project Primitive. And then we'll be throwing that into uh, Keyshot to get a render out of there. So that is what's going to be happening Friday. Um, question for you guys. If you have anything that you want to see in any of these Z Classroom live streams that I'm doing, uh, we're working on our scheduling for what we're doing for the next month. So we're probably going to continue this until this pandemic ends. So if you have any things that you want to see that you think would be a good thing for Z Classroom Live, I have a few slots that I haven't fully locked in yet and decided what I'm doing yet. So if you have any of that stuff, um, shoot them in the chat now and I'll... Uh, Take note of those, and if there's something that I can get done in two hours, um, we'll definitely hit up on it and see if we can get some stuff out of it. But basically, for my streams, it's based around uh, if you just download the trial is the goal here, and what you can do if in two hours if you just download the trial and start messing with ZBrush and showing the process from kind of A to B to get a result. So this one was using the um, BPR filters and generating a 2D illustration from 3D models that were quickly created inside the application. So I think that is it. Let me see if there's any other comments here quick. Paul's still in here. Paul's gonna cut his hair tomorrow. I need to cut mine too. Look at, th look at this, it's crazy. Uh, Web Etching is asking if you merge all the tools to color them at the same time, what if the tubes are in a different layer order? 
will affect the liability and subtraction. So if they, um, so yes, it, it will affect the hierarchy. So if you're using, say, something to cut from one of the wires and then you merge it into another one, that may affect that. My wires here for this one were all in that same chunk in my uh, subtool list. So it didn't matter if they were one subtool or multiple subtools, it was giving me the same result. But definitely if you start merging stuff down, each subtool can only take a one uh, Boolean operation. So it can be either union, subtraction, or intersection. So if you merge stuff down and you wanted one of those to be a subtraction process and not a union process, you will have to keep those separate as separate subtools. All right, you guys. So thank you all. And take care, you guys and gals. Thanks for coming out. And once again, if you have any uh, ideas, you can hit up Paul too. So we have one for fiber mesh here. I'm not sure what I can do easily in fiber mesh in two hours. Fiber mesh is a crazy thing too. But we're going to try this project primitive one on Friday. Um, we'll see how that one goes. And then if that one goes well, we may end up hitting up fiber mesh. <laughs> All right, so stay safe. Uh, once again, we have the trial out for ZBrush 2020. If you have anyone that is looking to get into ZBrush, wants to try digital sculpting, project, project, it's one of those two words. Leave me alone, Paul. Leave me alone. I'm gonna say it how I wanna say it. Project primitive. <laughs> All right, so ZBrush 2020, we have a trial out for that. Uh, if you have anyone that's looking for uh, ZBrush or maybe just wants to start playing with the program, you can download it for free and try it for 30 days. Uh, we have a Windows version and a Macintosh version. There is no iPad version, so if you have an iPad, you will not be able to use the trial. Um, for Friday, there's also the Bridge, Keyshot Bridge trial down here too. So if you want to mess or follow along with the stuff we'll be covering on Friday, definitely grab the ZBrush to Keyshot Bridge trial as well, and you can try that out. And then we have multiple ways to get into ZBrush. So there, some people may not know that there is monthly subscriptions now and perpetual licenses. So if you just need ZBrush for a month or maybe just wanna try it out for a month, you can definitely get a, a monthly subscription. Um, then we also have perpetual licenses, which we've never charged for an upgrade. So one little thing there, if you bought ZBrush once, you've paid nothing since you've bought it for all the upgrades and new additions that we've added. We also have ZBrush Core, which is our light version of ZBrush and Solomon and Daisuke We'll be doing uh, some coverage on that. And that you can get into ZBrush, uh, ZBrush Core as low as $10 a month. All right, so there we go. There's the quick spiel. So thank you guys and gals and stay safe and happy ZBrushing. Take care.